Okay, looks like we're going to have some fun this morning. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Oh, Jesus, thank you for this man. Thank you for what you've put on his heart for us this morning. Our hearts are ready to receive what you have to say, Lord Jesus. Be with him and let his lips be anointed to say what is on your heart, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the baskets are still going around. Where's my friend Zola from uh, Jesu Club? Is a legend. Can't you guys give me a song? Let's warm up before I get going. Come on. Come on, guys. Fana no Jesu, akeko o fana na ye, akeko o fana no Jesu, akeko o fana na ye, akeko o fana no Jesu, akeko o fana na ye. A keko o fana no Jesu, a keko o fana na ye. You're going to leave it at that? Okay, come on. Woo! These guys lift, these guys lifted my spirit on Wednesday morning at Jesu Club with songs like that and more. So thank you. And then Zola invited everybody to be here today and he led by example in the rain. Say to yourself, I am not a fair weather Christian. Well done to every single one of you. Yeah, I know for many of our guys coming on foot, I understand, but for those of us who have cars, as Grant said, what a better thing that we could do than to come and give thanks to the Lord for this incredible rain. So my friends, sure, you are the, the unlucky few that are going to get a word that has been brewing for a good while in my heart, and I'm super excited about it, but uh, it's so important, and I, in the last few weeks, I've been using a phrase saying that I feel God is calling us to a higher level of purity. So the elders said to me when we were in Joburg at National, as I said, Glenn, you better preach about this thing called purity because you can't just speak about it and not help us. So God has stirred some things in my heart, and I'm going to be sharing with us about joyfully overcoming impurity or the whole thing of purity. And I think I want to ask you, how important do you think your purity and my purity is to God? Okay. So if you're closer, you're Ubunyulu. You're, if you're Afrikaans, you're Reinheit, and if you're Shona, you're Kuchena. Wow. I got it right. Doc is good. <laughs> Your purity, how important is it to God? The Bible uses the word a lot, and often when it speaks about purity, it's speaking of holiness. So we're speaking about something of reverence this morning. This is a somber word in the midst. We might laugh now and again, but most of the time, I think we're going to be searching our hearts. So I listened last week, we were in Grahamstown, we had a great time ministering at a partnering church, thank you for releasing us, thank you to Duncan for preaching, Martin for hosting. I listened to Duncan's preach uh, last Sunday evening, and there was something he said, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but in essence he said, it's very easy for us to make Jesus Savior, but it's not so easy for us to live as if He's our Lord. And he used the scripture, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do. It's a sobering scripture. And it goes on even further to say, you called me Lord, Lord, but I don't even know you. So this thing of lordship is important. And I think there's a link between lordship and purity. Because my little brain says to me, I started asking, why is it so easy to accept him as savior? And why is it so difficult to make him Lord? Because when he's our savior, he does all the work. The finished work of the cross, God has done all the work. All we have to do is throw up our hands and say, Lord, save me. And the finished work of the cross enables us to be saved. We don't have to do anything more than that. It's a done deal. It's guaranteed. Nobody who's cried out earnestly in their heart for God to save them has not been saved. I don't ever believe. But this thing of lordship is a journey. It's a life decision. It's choices. We've got to make him lord day by day, moment by moment, decision by decision as we live our lives out. And that's a whole different kettle of fish. So in other words, there's something we've got to do. And as I said, I think our journey to make him lord of our whole life, because sometimes we make him lord of some chambers of our heart, but we keep some chambers to ourselves is linked to the purity journey as well. So just some different ways to look at purity quickly. Purity is freedom from anything that contaminates, anything that makes us dirty or impure. Purity describes who you are and what you do. 
I'll say that again. Purity describes who you are and what you do. In other words, your character and your conduct. Alan Verona would be proud of me for my alliteration. But you know what the most important thing is? It's, it's our character when we're alone. And I'll put an ish behind that in my notes. Who are you when you're alone? Who are you when you're alone? It's different, your, your public image and your, your in the private. God's interested in both, and especially the private one. A pure life is where sin no longer determines the choices we make. He does not wear the crown of our life anymore. Uh, there, there's somebody else, there's a master, a lord, because that's what lordship means. Lordship means he's master, he is boss, he's ruler, he's owner, he's the one who has power and authority over our whole lives. Is that your Lord? Can you use that to describe Jesus in your life? So purity is desiring to please God. That's another way to look at it. And how do we please God? We fear Him, first of all. And I'll say that again. We fear Him. It says the beginning of all wisdom. We worship Him like we did just now. We obey Him. We cherish Him. And we love Him. So how do we know what pleases God? I go to Psalm 119, verse 9, the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. It says, how do you know, how do you please God? It says, how can a young man, I'll come back to that, keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. So God says, if you want to be pure, it's simple, just follow my word. Everything, I want everything that you need to make a decision on, is this right or wrong? Is this pure? Is this impure? God's word is going to tell you that. But I like the fact that he says, how can a young man, you know why I think he says a young man? Because I'm sorry to say, I think a young man is one of the worst animals on, on the planet in some ways, okay? In terms of sin. If you go to the prisons right now in the U.S., 93% of people in prison are men and only 7% are women. Did you know that? 93 verse 7. And it's, and it's often the young. Yes, you're not angels though, ladies, okay? You just don't, I think you just don't get caught sometimes. You're a bit, bit more subtle. But when God says... He specifically says a young man, because he knows a young man is wild. Bossy, well done for getting you out of the floods all the way from Kwasikele in the rain. But he's, he's, he speaks to a young man, but he's saying, that's the worst case scenario. But everybody, all of you, if you want to be pure, just follow my word. Sounds easy, yeah. When God created everything in Genesis 1 and 2, how do you think it was? Perfectly pure. Because God can't create anything that's not pure, because he created us in his image, and he's perfect and pure. <laughs> See how simple this is? But something happened along the way. Sin came and it corrupted purity. It robbed us of our purity. Psalm 14 verse 3 says, All, it's a big word, it includes you and me, all have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. So none of us can do this in our own strength. That's what I'm telling you right today. You cannot be pure. You cannot be righteous in your own strength. And Albert picked up on the word beautifully in, in the prayer meeting this morning, this thing of righteousness, which is linked, and I'm going to talk about that just now. But I like that it says uh, all have turned away. They have together become corrupt. In other words, we're not always good for each other. Because I'm going to do it because somebody else is going to do it. I want to say to the teenagers in the room, forget peer pressure. Don't do something because somebody else is doing it. Go to God's word and say, is this right or wrong? Is this in God's will or is it not? And that's how we're meant to live. So, impurity, sadly, is the thing that's often mentioned in the word that separates us from the presence of God. Impurity in our life cuts us off from the presence of God. And it's, it makes us calloused. But on the other side, the good news is Matthew 5 verse 8 says, and this is a great encouragement, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart because they'll see God. I don't know when last you saw God, and I'm not saying like a physical seeing. There's just something of sensing Him. Our prayer meeting on Wednesday night was powerful, friends. Like we sat around on a bench, and we just had time with God. And you know what God said? He said to Duncan, um, observe me, see me. You don't see me anymore in this world. You just look past me. Slow down. Observe me see me. Dave stood in the corner over there and God said to him three times, what Dave? Love me. Just love me. Dr. Lulu came and she sat here and she said, know me. God said to me, know me. He was personal with us, one-on-one, -on -one, speaking to hearts of people in the same language, all in exactly the same language. God wants us to be pure so we can see him, so we can sense his presence, so we don't get calloused to the things of the Holy Spirit. So we don't come here and say, oh, that worship was okay. We blame Patricia. <laughs> no, it's what's going on in your heart determines how worship goes. Because it's all about God and not about us. 
But when our hearts are clouded with impurities, we struggle to experience God's presence. We struggle to see what He's doing. We struggle to hear His voice. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's happened in all of our lives. We've been on a journey. Colossians, just some scriptures speak about this. Colossians 3, verse 5 to 6 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. There's even more harsh scriptures that I could read, but I'll read one more. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, in a similar vein. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, there it is again. Impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are harsh scriptures, not so. But if we want deep, intimate fellowship with God, we've got to find a way to reclaim our purity. Because we live in a world that is dark. We have, we have been born into a sinful world. Psalm 24, verse 3 to 4 says, this is, this is how it works. Who may ascend? You know the scripture well. Who may ascend? The mountain of the Lord. Who may stand in that holy place? The one who has? Say it with me. Clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart puts us to stand in the presence of God. So what happened in the Old Testament? If the guys in the Old Testament wanted to reclaim their purity, what did they have to do? They had to make animal sacrifices. And they had to make them very specifically, in a very specific way. That's the only way that they could reclaim their purity. Okay. Luckily for us, we live on the other side of the cross. So I'm sorry, be sitting this side of this side of the pulpit, you're on the wrong side of the cross for today. Okay, you guys, you're redeemed and restored and righteous and all the rest. But in the new covenant, thank goodness, all that we have to do is to lay our claim of faith in Jesus Christ. And the finished work of the cross reclaims our purity. It says His righteousness is, impu is imputed to us, it is given to us, it is credited to us, not because of anything we do. So there's, in this, this, this talk, this sermon, this preach that I'm doing on purity, understand God's part and our part. There, there is a role that we need to play, but we can't play it until God has played his part and we have stepped in to that place of making him savior and, and uh, claiming that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. It says in Romans 6, uh, where it speaks about this, it says we've been baptized into his death and we've been raised uh, as a new person. Our old self has died. Our old self is gone. We need to live like that. So, we cannot change in our own strength. Paulie, Nikki, anybody, not picky. We cannot be pure in our own strength. I want to say, you cannot do this like by just, mm, I'm going to grit this out. We must rely on the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, there's the key, we might become the righteousness of God. It's worth reading again. God made him who had no sin to be sin. How unfair is that for us? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough. We're not clever enough. We're not whatever enough to be able to work this thing out, to find our way back into a place of good standing and right standing with God. And I think we have taken and allowed the, the grace of God. I'll speak about that, but I think we've taken a bit of advantage of it in some times. So you know what we're really good at? We're good at rationalizing. We're good at compromising. We're good at trying to say, to work things out in our mind. So we will make statements like, this isn't hurting anybody, this thing that I'm doing now. How can it be wrong? How can it be making me impure? Hmm? I deserve this. Have you ever f found yourself saying that? I actually deserve this. I've like worked hard or whatever. I can have this little, this little sin on the side. I'm preaching to the choir here. I don't know who's listening. What about just this once? Just, just once. I'm just going to, just once I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. and people live on the edge. So we know what's right and wrong, but we live on the edge. So let me show you what we actually do. So Floyce, help me with this. So in life, there's only, two, there's only two ways. There's two options in life. It's either right or wrong. Okay? It's godly or it's ungodly. It's good or it's bad. Not so. Do you agree? Is there a third category? Okay. So it's either God's way or it's the world's way. Simple. You pick. You know, when you're doing that thing, in that moment, you know whether this is pure or whether it's impure.
there we have it. But this is what we do. We create a third category. We say, okay, well, there's things that are clearly wrong, and there's things that are beautifully right, but we create a gray area. And look what happens when I create a gray area. Just a little path on top. You see how that thing stands all on its own? I could run acro across the top of this little gray path if it was strong enough. But this, the black and white, the way it's supposed to be, right and wrong, there's no way to find a middle, middle way. But we live on the edge. We create. It's not the truth, but our perception is this is not so bad. This stuff here in the gray area, I can get away with this. I can rationalize it. I can live like that. It's a slippery slope. It's a very dangerous, it's a narrow little path, but it's a path that we create. So I'm going to leave it over here to remind you, if you've got any paths that you've created, any rationalization around stuff in your life that God says he wants to, to let go of, then maybe this morning is the way to just delete that and get back to God's purpose of right or wrong, black or white, in or out. That's how it works with purity. Okay. Super quiet. Pure living comes from a pure heart. It says our heart is sinful above all else. So we, we have to sort out our heart. We have to guard our heart. And we've had a whole series on, on how important our heart is. So I want to say to you, a heart that's been touched by God, that's a pure heart, is going to be able to live a pure life out. That's how it works. But we have to desire purity above all else. And, and the two scriptures that I read spoke a lot about, and, and to be honest, when I speak of purity, what's the first thing that comes to your mind in the world that we live in? Sexuality. Sexual purity. So that's pornography, that's affairs, that's lust, that's all of those things. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Do not, so, so there's others. I want to unpack a few others. And I think Duncan even touched on a few similar areas last week but ar around the Lordship. But there's different areas that God wants us to be pure in. I'm feeling specifically for us as a body. I'm not going to dwell into that. I'm not going to drill into that one. But I'm saying do not overlook it. Do not take that one lightly. That's one of the biggest cancers that we have and I'm, t I'm afraid it's in the church we know that because we have divorces and we have situations that we have to deal with you know what's going on in your life you come in here none of us know what you who you are in private how accountable are you who, who do you talk to about what's going on in your life this thing can stop us friends it can stop us from sensing the presence of God it can stop us as a church from going into the more that he has and it's right that we do this just before we go into the series on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit cannot mix. Oil and water don't mix. God's created something pure. He cannot have fellowship with what is not pure. Okay, so these are some of the other obvious or the areas other than that of, of sexual purity. And I want to say you go before God and you sort that out with Him if there's anything that is undone. So what other areas do you think God wants us to be pure in? I want to say the first one is that uh, our dealings and relationships with other people need to be pure. So your purity has consequences for other people, not just for yourself. You hear what I'm saying? Okay, very important. Ezekiel 45 verse 10 says uh, you are to use accurate scales. Why does, why does God put that in there? So in other words, when you have, this is business dealings, and, and I just felt to say this, Christians often do business with Christians, and it often doesn't end well. Is, uh, have you experienced that? Sadly, and I, I want us to support each other, whatever. But it comes from an unrealistic set of expectations where somehow the guy receiving the service or the goods almost wants it for free because this is a Christian brother. And sometimes the Christian brother giving the service or the, or, or the, the goods or whatever says, I'm giving it to a Christian so I can give second rate. No. <laughs> fair, fair, fair for, fee for service, whatever. Be generous. Allow for generosity or whatever in it. But I think we get it wrong sometimes that we actually can't even work with each other, let alone love each other and get along with each other. So our purity of our relationships with each other is important. But let's go on. Like I say, our purity impacts other people. Just ask the wife of a cheating husband how his purity impacts her and the whole family. Or the other way around, ask a husband when the wife has been messing around. Your purity impacts your whole family and everybody Ask the wife and a daughter of an accountant in Port Elizabeth who decided to take two big spas for millions of rands in fraud. 
ask that daughter and that wife, the wife who's now living off handouts from other people and the daughter who's trying to study at Stelly's and is, is now embarrassed because she's got nowhere to stay and people have to look after her because all the assets have been frozen because dad decided my big salary wasn't enough. I needed to fraud another few million. That impurity of the father and his decision impacts radically on the whole family. It's like God wants to stop some people in their tracks today. Serious, there's a sobering thing to say, don't go further with this thing. Give it to me, find a place of repentance, let me heal you, get to somebody for counseling, whatever you need to do, but don't carry on down that path because you're going to hurt people around you through your sin. Because what, what makes us impure? Sin, simple. There's no other way. So how are you doing? And I'm not pulling a joey. <sighs> that went over some he other heads. If you watch Friends, you know what I'm talking about. How's your thought life? How pure is your thought life? Like I said, mine wasn't so lacquer on Wednesday morning. Guys had done stuff here that they shouldn't have done and whatever. And I was thinking thoughts to, to get equal. <laughs> and God clearly says that's not the thoughts that I want you to have. So he has two beautiful scriptures around our thoughts. I love them both. I'm just going to read the scriptures and they, they will speak for themselves. Second Corinthians 10 verse 5. This is the way God wants our thought life. And, and it all starts here, friends. We, I mean, everything after this is going is to build from our thoughts. So we've got to get it right here. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So therefore, that means there's no room for lustful, anxious, divisive, arrogant, selfish thoughts. Even being anxious is sin. It's making you impure because God says, don't worry. <laughs> but we do. Okay? Can I, can I start something? Can I start something? It says, take captive every thought that is not of Christ and make it obedient to Christ. I, I, want, I want to see people going like this. And you can be quicker than me. Catching those thoughts. <laughs> Sounds silly, but it's like be intentional when a thought comes that is not of God, that is impure, whether you're looking at the wrong thing or whether you're going down the wrong bunny trail, catch that thought physically like the scripture says it. Take it captive. Lock that thing up. Because you haven't gone down the bunny trail too far yet if you catch it at the thought stage. But you're going to see just now, if you don't, it's going to manifest in your life and it's going to work itself out in other ways. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, this is the type of things you must think about. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Isn't that enough to keep our minds busy? <laughs> if we can think about all those amazing things, Cynthia, when you're cooking up a meal at Remos, you're thinking those things all the time, eh? Because you never have difficult clients. We saw Remos on TV the other day on Ultimate Bry Master. Beautiful. Okay, so get your thoughts pure. If you don't, they're going to manifest in words that are not pure. They're going to manifest in you saying things that you shouldn't say. You're going to start speaking stuff over your own life. You're going to spew things at other people. And it says we have the power of life and death in our tongue. So how are your words? How pure are your words? And as I said, you don't just cough something out. You've been entertaining and thinking about that thing for a while before you just say the wrong thing. Whether it's a racist remark, whether it's swearing, whether whatever it is, it comes out from what you have been meditating on and thinking about. So what are you thinking about? We've done that one. Ephesians 4 verse 29 is my scripture about our words. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. There's two things in there. It says, when you speak, it should build up people and it should benefit those who've heard it. Can you honestly say that? That chat that you had at the bra fire last night, and maybe it was a cold, rainy, but the last time you were at a bra with all your mates or whatever, when you finished there, did people benefit from what you had to say, and were they built up by what you had to say or not? In the workplace, at the dining room table, whatever, when you finish speaking, ask yourself, did what I just say benefit people and build them up, or did it do the opposite? Because that's not what God wants us to say. It's that old thing, if you've got nothing good to say, just rather don't say anything. It works well. Two or three more of these, and then I've got, uh, I'm very thirsty today. You see, I've got a big jug to drink from. How are your actions? So your thoughts become words, become actions. Are you living a life that is holy? 
And as we said, it's got a lot to do with our hearts in the first place. So there's a simple scripture for me on this one. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So whatever you do, is there anything outside of the category of whatever you do? Is there something you can do that you can put on the side or put into your, your little path on top here, this little gray area that we've created? No, because it says whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. So uh, is, if I'm going to do this, is it going to bring glory to God? There's another little, I'm trying to give you like um, triggers, warnings before you go down these paths. If I do this, is it going to bring glory to God? Mm -mm. Clearly it's on the black side or sometimes oh, maybe it's in the gray side, but let me rather not err on that side. I'm just not going to do it because it's not going to bring glory to God. Sounds super spiritual, but it's a good way to test what's happening in our heart. So I want to say to you, maybe today you say, well, the horse is bolted. It's too late. I'm used goods. I'm impure. I've messed up. I've sinned. There's no way back for me. What's the use? What's the use of all the stuff that Glenn's talking about today? The good news is God says he can redeem your present or your, your past, firstly. Does not, does not disqualify us from our present relationship with God. If it is, then you're allowing the enemy to still accuse you and to bring condemnation. You're not supposed to be in that place. If you've come through the cross, if you are saved, your past should not rob you of your present amazing relationship with the Lord. And even more so, it cannot affect, your past cannot affect the glorious future that God has in store for all of us. See, because God is a God, the same. We sang the, the, the song today, said the same God. So he's the same God of yesterday, today, and forever. And in exactly the same way, he's gone before us to, to help us walk this road. He's not left us on our own to try and, squeeze out purity, like I said. We can't. There's nothing we can do to get it right. So this is what Romans uh, 6, verse 1 to 2 says. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. The Afrikaans version says, where uh, we are those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? So there's this, this pattern that God says, there's grace that comes to forgive you. But, like I said, we must be careful not to abuse it. We must be very, very careful not to say, well, I can just sin because there's a hyper grace movement that says that you just keep sinning as much as you like and God's grace is just going to meet you there and increase. No, no. <laughs> We've got to be very careful. So this is actually what God says about how he takes our sins away. So I'm just bringing that as, as a counterbalance because it seems too good to be true. What I'm going to demonstrate for you just now and what I'm saying in these scriptures seems too good to be true. But it is true because of God's righteousness that has been put on us as a cloak. So in Psalm 51 verse 2, the psalmist says, Wash away all my iniquity, all my filth, all my dirt, and cleanse me from my sin. In 1 John 1 verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's a purity that comes. And lastly, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit and perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. To me, the key in that scripture is out of reverence for God. Because we have reverence and fear, like I said earlier, of God, we are able to understand that He's, he's purified us. But do we continue sinning intentionally? No. If we do, what happens? We still have the righteousness of God before us that makes us pure. So we stand before God pure because of the blood of Jesus and because of what Jesus has done. So let me show you something, and I'll maybe, maybe Albert can help me. I think it might work well. Albert, you can come join me. Can everybody see this table? Okay. Hmm? So Albert is like me and you, and we all sin. So we start off, God creates us perfect. Can you see the jug, Paul? Okay, you can see the jug. Perfectly clear, pure water. This is how God creates us. But we come into a fallen world, and then we start sinning and sinning. And it says that we, we become dirty, we become impure. So why don't you do some sinning there, Albert, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a, ooh, ooh. And then this morning, you were thinking that thought again. Put some more. And you don't, get, you don't get much dirtier than that, do you? But how does God see us in this moment? So he says to us, to those who've come through the cross, 
We're still going to play another role. You can stay. For those who've come through the cross, who have acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior, he says there's a finished work of the cross. So he has my little cross. And he applies the cross to our lives. And look what happens. Okay. <laughs> but now, Albert goes across the road. No, you're not finished. Albert goes across the road and let me not put certain sins on him. Okay, Albert sins again this afternoon. <laughs> put a little bit. What happens? Is he getting dirty again? Because of the righteousness that Christ has won for us through the finished work of the cross. Sin some more. And the cross just says, no, thank you. That's how God sees us, my friends. Thank you, Albert. Why don't you put the lid on? No magic involved. If you want to know how, you come and ask me. No magicians. This is you and me before God right now, if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. Pure. But fight for that purity. Live in that purity. Make decisions to make him Lord. It's like I said, we, when you make him Lord over all, he's going to help you walk and say no. He's going to help you say no. This is very, this is not even black. It's, it's not dark gray. It's black. Don't go there. It's bad. It's wrong. He speaks to our conscience. He, he helps us down the path that he's called us to. The power of the cross, my friends, changed everything. So we, we can celebrate what the world calls Easter, but we need to celebrate that every time we come into his presence, the power of the cross that changes everything, that sets us free, that enables us to do something that we cannot do. Like I said, the reclaiming of our purity has got nothing to do with us. It's already been done for us. So that's why God says, I, for, I forget your sins. I forgive them and then I actually forget about them. Because of the work of my son. Because he was not sin, but I made him sin for your good. This is a beautiful truth, friends. This is good news. But we need to walk in it. Because the reality is, is we, we, we drift away from God. We don't sense his presence. We don't hear his voice. And we don't see him the way we're supposed to see him. When we don't walk and partner with this purity that has been given and imputed and put on us. You with me? I, I really, I, I pray that we have with such a sense of soberness, but a desire to say, Lord, I want to live. I don't care if you're 85 or you're the youngest person in the room that you would say, because yes, even Auntie Betty still sins. I know that. But <laughs> <laughs> that you would have such a desire in your heart to say, God, I want to live pure before you. And, and the way we do that is we kill pride. We we, we kill, we, we walk as humble men and women. We have accountability towards each other. There's a scripture in James that says, your, your sins, confess your sins one to another so that healing can come. Not forgiveness. God does the forgiving, but when we take the sin out of the darkness and we put it in the light, then God says, I'm going to heal you. And it's like God wants to heal us as a body. There's so much more that he wants us to do and places he wants us to go. But he says, I want to know that your vessels can be trusted. But you know what? I'm going to finish with this. Psalm 4 verse 3 says, the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Set apart the godly, the pure, for himself. So being set apart means you have a specific purpose. You are special. And you know, to, to me, the thing that, that convinces me, that makes it absolutely true that we are special to God, that we are set apart, is that he chose. When Jesus ascended, the ascension day is coming soon. If he didn't ascend, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't have descended. And we wouldn't have had the Holy Spirit. And where does God choose for his Holy Spirit to live in the New Testament? In us. It says that we are a vessel of the Holy Spirit. We're a house. We're a place that the Holy Spirit lives. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to live in filth and impurity. He's meant to live. But the fact that God has placed and said, I'm going to, the house, the dwelling place for my Holy Spirit is going to be in my believers, in my sons and daughters. That convinces me that we are set apart. That we are special. But let's live like that. Okay. Do we have another song, Musos? Patricia? Okay. Why don't you guys come? I feel the best way for us to respond, and I think there's a response required in all of our hearts, is just to say thank you to God, gratitude that he sees us like that jar. 
and you saw the sin that went in there, went in there, but it disappears before God. He forgets about it, and that doesn't seem fair, but I'm going to move this pulpit out of the way, and I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to land in a worship song. Lord. Why don't you stand, please, friends? <laughs> Father, before I point a finger at any one of uh, my brothers and sisters in the church, why don't you start with me? Why don't you start in my heart, in my mind, in my actions, in my thoughts, in my omissions? I want to walk before you as the purest vessel that I've ever been. I might be 53 now, but I say that the years to come, I want them to be even purer than ever before, Father. Because there is a sanctification work that you are doing. You are making us a little bit more and more like Jesus every time we make a good decision. And every time we learn from a bad decision and we make a comeback from a bad decision. God, you're a God of the comeback. And I speak that over some of my brothers and sisters this morning, that it is not too late. You are not too far gone for God, excuse me, to restore you and to purify you afresh. Father, every time we, we, we look at your word, you said, how can we stay pure? Is by just looking at your word and following your word and like applying it like, like medicine to our lives. Just like that cross just purified us again, Father. So I pray we would never, ever, ever take the sacrifice of the cross for granted. That every time we sin, it's like it says, we're actually putting Jesus back on the cross again. And we're crucifying him all over again. And we don't want to do that, Father. So won't you help us? We ask you, Holy Spirit, to be the one who convicts us of sin and impurity in our life. I pray for great fruitfulness to come in the seasons ahead as, uh, as testimonies are given of the things that you crushed. That people were considering going down certain paths and you blocked them, you stopped them. Father, I pray for fair scales. I pray that we would not cheat on taxes. We would not do anything that is not right in your eyes. That our relationships with each other, Father, we would give each other the benefit of the doubt. We would not be those that would fall to this thing of offense and, and, and division comes out of that. Father, that is something that you hate. You hate grumbling. You hate it when we speak um, cynically and negatively about uh, the world, this church, this, this city that you've given us and placed us in. So, Father, won't you help us in our mind, spirit, soul, mouth, actions, everything, but start in our hearts, Father. As we said, it's, it's, it's about a pure heart and from that place because we want to be those that say we see you high and lifted up. We can see you, Lord. We observe you. We, we gaze and we see what you're busy doing. We hear your voice. We, yeah, we know that you are speaking to us and commanding us because we, we've said for the last while there's a time for enlisting and there's an army that you're raising up here at Joy to the Nations. So won't you use us, Father? Right now, I pray that as we sing this song to you, there will be hearts that will turn back to you, hearts that will open up chambers and areas of their life that have not been opened up to you so that full lordship can come in our life because when that happens purity is just going to be the natural um, outworking in our life Father but we thank you when we mess up not if we mess up your grace is there for us but we want to rely as little as possible on your grace that our hearts are just so in love with you and so cherishing you and so obedient to you that we follow you with all of our hearts and you are able to entrust us with more and more thank you Father as we worship you